Brian Caitman, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Hey, hey, thanks so much for having me back on. I'm excited. You just released a, uh, a major oeuvre, a major, a major work, uh, this documentary, Meet Me Halfway. And I've got to say, I love it. So first of all, thank you for all of the effort and time and money and energy that went into it. Oh, I really appreciate that. It is definitely a, a feat of humanity that we were able to get the film to the place that it's at and get it out there in the world. So I really do uh, appreciate that, that positive sentiment. Yeah, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, what I loved about it and ask you a bunch of questions about decisions you made. But first, let's just, uh, you know, reintroduce yourself to people who might not have heard you the first time or, or recognize sure. your name. Sure, yeah. I'm uh, Brian Kateman, president and co-founder of the Reducitarian Foundation. And we're part of a movement of reducitarians, people who are excited to cut back on the amount of animal products that they consume. It's built around this idea that meat consumption is not an all or nothing premise, that every single plant-based meal is one that is worthy of celebration. And we have lots of different programs that are designed to help spread that message. One of them being our latest, the documentary, Meet Me Halfway. Cool. So you said you, before we started recording, you said you've been working on this for about five years? Five years. Yeah, really in roughly 2015, sort of the, the concept of the film came to be, I think we started actually filming in end of 2015 or early 2016. So wh what was the first concept? Like, what was the idea? Like, um, I don't, you didn't have the book out yet, right? No, I didn't have the book out yet. Um, you know, it's funny, the film evolved tremendously <laughs> over the years. I think originally the idea was that it was going to be a how to eat less meat film. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would kind of walk people through the process of adopting a, a lifestyle like Meatless Monday or Weekday Vegetarian. Maybe we would showcase people in, in detail who've gone on the journey to, to make changes in their diet. And quite frankly, it was going to be much simpler. It was going to be probably something like veganism is a pipe dream. The average person is never going to go vegan. Um, you know, we have to eat less meat. There's no other way forward. Here's how to do it. Um, and it would have been really simple. Obviously, Meet Me Halfway is not that. Um, it, it counts for a lot of different perspectives and has a lot more nuance and at times even disagrees with its own premise. Um, and I'm glad that we, that, that it, by the nature of just taking the time to make the film, um, my feelings and, and uh, thoughts evolved and I think what we produced is a, a much greater intellectual contribution. But yeah, mm -hmm. so definitely, definitely changed a lot since its initial perception, or sorry, conception in 2015. Yeah, so that, that let me piggyback onto like the, the main, the thing that I love the most about it is that, so it, it starts out following a formula, which is you are the narrator and you're sort of a proxy for the audience. Right. There's a certain innocence like, gee whiz, I wonder. Now, <laughs> now, that formula we have seen used in, you know, Forks Over Knives and Cowspiracy and Game Changers. But in I don't want to say a disingenuous way, but in a um, in an intentional way that's a little bit misleading in that the person who you know is kind of going back in time to when they were unsure and when they were gee whiz I wonder what's going on but like throughout the entire film you maintain this it's like, it's like this is actually your your honest take like I don't know the answer I don't exactly know what the right thing is there are so many competing interests every time I talk to someone on a different side they make some sense there was such openness and humility in it that it it kind it kind of left me a little bit unsteady, in in just in a really beautiful way. Like you you didn't end up with the reveal saying this is what you should have been believing all along, and now I brought you there. And I'm really curious how that came about. Was that intentional? Is that you being you? Like I love like it. I love that. Yeah, I know. I really I really appreciate that, and I think that essentially became the main goal of the film. You know, I think those sort of other go vegan films are, are valuable. I would love it if more people were vegan. There's no better way to reduce your consumption of animal products than to go vegan. Um, but I have to admit, 
essentially, you know, like I said, in 2015, I was kind of your, I mean, I was in my early twenties. I was pretty arrogant. You know, I thought I had all the answers and knew exactly what needed to be do. I mean, we've been telling people to go vegan. Why don't we just tell them to eat less meat? I'm sure that'll reduce consumption of animal products. And, you know, I've been at this for a while. I've been doing this for, you know, a couple of years now, and I'm no stranger to the data. I see that meat consumption's on the rise. I see that in the United States, we've never eaten more meat than ever before. We're up to 225 pounds per person, according to the USDA as of 2020. So, you know, the, the question changed. The question of the film became essentially, why the hell is this not working? I mean, why are people not reducing their consumption of animal products? I'm genuinely this person who's trying to make something happen and it's not working. And what I notice in my own thinking, the older I become, um, is that I find myself at times surrounded by a lot of people who are very confident and they feel as though they know in, in, in many areas of their life, you know, not just in their work, but relationships and family and so on. And there's this kind of, you know, this is the way you're supposed to be. And I find myself being humbled a lot, the older I get. And I don't know the answers to many questions. There are some things I do feel like I know the answers. I hate factory farming. I hate it with a passion. Um, I really do think people need to cut back on the amount of animal products they consume and eat more plant-based foods. But when it, is more than that, or if it's how to actually make that happen, I genuinely don't know the answer. And I think if anybody knew the answer, you would have seen the world look differently. But right now it's going in the opposite direction. So yeah, I do enter, I did enter with some level of humility, but the more I talk to people and the more experiences I underwent, um, that just more genuinely confused I became. And that's really where I'm at today. You know, I don't know what's going to end factory farming. Um, I um, am deeply distrustful of anyone who says they know with 100% confidence the answer to that question. And I encourage everyone else to be skeptical of people who have a silver bullet solution to something. Um, but I am happy that there are different solutions that are on the table. And that's, well, I'm sure we'll talk about that, but this is essentially kind of a conclusion for me from the film is I don't know what is going to end factory farming, but there are, there are options that are not factory farming and let's pursue those and, and see what happens. So yeah, it did, it did come in. You know, if I think if I made the film when I was 20, it would have been an arrogant film. Here's the answer. I think that I made it in my late twenties into my early thirties. I think um, I was able to be a little bit more humble and honest about my own vulnerability and insecurities and, and doubt. And I'm really glad that that's reflected in the film. And I hope if, if nothing else, the film is remembered as an honest portrayal of the complexities in, in the fight to end factory farming. Mm. I, I think it's great that, you know, the half-life of arrogance is so short in you. Like I'm, I'm, I'm now entering my late fifties. I feel like I'm, I'm just getting there. I look back <laughs> on stuff I wrote like three years ago and I'm like, Boy, I was a know-it-all twat. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there's lots of things in my life that I still could use some humility on. But yes, I do. I do have some awareness of that, as I, I know you do too. Although I appreciate your your uh, attempt at being at being humble. Well, um, if you only knew. Um, <laughs> so this film sort of starts and ends with your parents, mm -hmm. um, and that you know it seemed very personal, and actually. I kind of had to stop watching the very first scene because it was such a cringe fest of, um, I mean, it was, it was so intimate <laughs> and personal and it reminded me of all my Jewish relatives. And, and I'm curious just about the conversations that went on between you and your parents and maybe, you know, with, with Journey and, and other people in the film, like, should this be in this film? Like, is this, is this revealing too much? Is it, is it kind of, you know, like my, my, your dad is hilarious and he's adorable. And he's also saying some very outrageous things at the beginning. And like there's, there was some, I was had some embarrassment on behalf of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. That's, that's interesting. Um, look, you know, filmmaking is a funny process because, you know, you see a snippet 
of, of, a, of a longer conversation. So the conversation that I had with my parents that particular day, though obviously I'm their son, so I've had many conversations with them, was, was three hours. So we cut three hours down into maybe seven minutes or so. I will tell you this though, Journey, my co-director, grew up in, in Ojai, California. His parents are either, I hope, I think self-described hippies, or they have certainly the, the you know, they're, they grew up, they're, they're vegan, they, they, you know, the, many of the qualities of being highly progressive, so on. And I would tell, I told Journey about my parents, and I think there was a sense of either skepticism or just you really hadn't met people quite like my parents before. So we went to the supermarket and I, you know, I said, he, he wanted he wanted me to prepare like this very luxurious meal for them and like have them sit down. I was like, dude, this is not like, you know, they're not going to have cauliflower steaks. This is not a thing with my parents. They don't eat vegetables. And so we purchased a whole, you know, array of items. Um, and, you know, uh, my mom is, is anxious about the idea of me cooking in her, in her house. So I was also limited by that. So this is kind of why we brought this. If you see the film, there's a package guacamole everyone's outraged that we used non non fresh avocados but this is partly why um and you know i knew what i was going to get with my my parents and we covered many topics you know we covered religion we covered evolution we the, my dad is is uh he has a free mind and will go in many different ways so my part of my job and this comes on the film a little is to kind of always bring him back to the central topic which is about our relationship with food and it's funny you say this, I knew, so let me say this, I knew that people were going to be shocked by some, you know, by what, what they had seen and it was hilarious and honest and intimate and um, yeah, it is, there is a feeling of vulnerability there. You know, I have friends and family who don't work in this movement who know me from middle school and college and who see this film and they see my parents and they see the house and they, they you know, they see, they see what my life was like um, and that's just a, a sliver of of my personal development and my relationship with my parents and, and so on. It doesn't go into my, you know, trials of therapy and so on to, to like everyone has to go through to unravel some of what they, what they experience. Um, but, you know, some people think my dad is completely reasonable. And this is what's so interesting. Like my sister shared the video on her, her Facebook and I saw the comments, you know, it's just like a little trailer. And it's like, Oh, like that, you know, the, the young guy seems a little, whacked out but I really like what the you know what the, the older gentleman is saying so it was another reminder to me that where many of us um live in a little bit of a bubble we know people who think very similar to us and yes it's it could be perceived as embarrassing among the people that I know but there are lots of people who are embarrassed that I'm the son of a person who has all the answers and I'm lost and confused uh and so but, you know, the film doesn't exist without them because they are an essentially my this film is essentially a, a sort of love letter to my parents. Right. I mean, I love my parents. They're not eating healthy. They're not going to go vegan or vegetarian. What changes can they make? They're very much, um, you know, reduced vegetarian is very much a product of my upbringing in, in Staten Island, New York. So I'm really grateful for them. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, oh, even like so many people have commented that they must be actors because the, who hasn't had avocados? I mean, it's absurd. I mean, there, and this is the thing, it's like one out of 10 people don't get the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables in their diet. I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up eating fruits and vegetables and I know lots of people who didn't. So again, it's this kind of, I hope it's an awakening to people that there is a broad spectrum of humans out there. And you know this better than anyone as someone who thinks about marketing communications that we need to be very thoughtful of our messaging and be aware that not everyone is exactly like we are. Yeah, there was one really, I interpreted as a, in a particular way, a poignant moment where you're trying to get your mom to try the avocado with, with a chip or something. And you, you make a little joke, like, you know, I'm a millennial, of course I liked avocado toast. And it seems like she didn't get it. Like she hadn't, she hadn't, wasn't even aware of that sort of stereotype and it was like you know it's like oh the audience is like oh yeah yeah no she is i mean she didn't know what avocado toast was um i i don't even know if she, if she knows i don't even know if she knows what a millennial is i mean mm. i really don't um yeah so no there's an absolute cultural clashing here uh, you know from a from a just the generation and 
you know, I, my mom has never been on a plane before. She's never been out of the country. You know, I've, I've been to 15 countries or something like that. So it's just, it's just total different world and, and set of experiences. And I'm in some sense, very privileged and, and lucky to have those that my parents didn't necessarily have those experiences. Yeah. What did your parents think about filming? Just about bring, you know, I don't know how many people there were. I imagine there was somebody with a boom mic and a couple of camera people and like, what did, like, what did they think they were doing and why were they, you know, is it just, oh, Brian's got another crazy thing. Like, he, you know, it was like a power ranger in middle school and now he's doing this or. They, you know, that's the thing about, I love about my parents is, you know, I could be working for the factoring art farming industry and they'd be very impressed by the, my accomplishments. I mean, there's a real unconditional love that exists here. They, and I'm very, very, no matter my weird upbringing, you know, I was loved as a kid and I'm loved now. And it could be no matter what I was, relatively speaking, what I was doing. Um, yeah, we were making a documentary. I don't know where it's gonna go. It's, you know, it's about food issues. It's about this reducitarian thing. Um, and they knew that. My mom did not want to be on camera um, and that was difficult for her. And it's something I really appreciated that she did. Um, I kind of cashed in, I felt like, it was like, you know, I, I don't ask a lot. I mean, you've raised me and you've, <laughs> so you, I really probably shouldn't even be asking, but it's like, I really need to do this one thing for me. You know, we're not gonna, we'll, we'll, we're not gonna, I couldn't, there were, there were rules. Like I couldn't film the messy parts of the house. And I, you know, I promised them I wasn't going to make them look, bad at least in the sense that I feel is is valid um my dad couldn't have been more excited I mean he, he's <laughs> super excited has no uh you know no nothing no no worries to give uh and but I'm sure if I showed him again that you know he he's what he said he feels is completely valid and true I, maybe about except with the, the health component you know that's something we'll talk about I'm sure but the realization mm -hmm. around health but um yeah, he's, you know, again, every day he hangs out with people who think very similar to him. Uh, I'm sure they say things like, what's wrong with this generation? How did, how, why, where did we go wrong? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's wild to me that this, so yeah, but it was a challenge. Oh, and there was only, it was just Journey and me. So there, there was, there was Journey set up one, one camera on the far left, and then there, he's operating another camera on the right. Um, the lighting is actually a little bit a little bit off in the, the film because we didn't want to add lots of lights. We wanted it to try to seem as natural as possible. And they definitely, de definitely delivered on that, which is, which is good. And I tell you the three hours of footage we have are all nuts. I mean, it's just three hours of absolute insanity. And it was very, very difficult for us to, we got it down to 20 minutes and then to 10 minutes and then made some difficult decisions, cutting off a couple more minutes. So there's a whole scene where they try blueberries for the first, my mom had never had a blueberry before. Um, so, I, feel yeah. like, I feel like I could watch that if I were just slightly high. I could watch I, all three hours. I, I would definitely need to be high in order to make it through through that again. Yeah, I, I, I get, you know, I talk to my parents weekly, so I get the live version um, <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> Are they famous now? Like, do they, do, like, <laughs> have they, like, experience life differently? Like, people recognizing them or reaching uh, out to them? Not yet. No, there wasn't. There's funny. There was a discussion around whether to advertise the trailer specifically to, to Staten Island residents um, in our Facebook ads. And I was like, ah, eh, like, let's I'm sure people there will find out about it anyway. Let's not, uh, you know, saturate mm -hmm. my parents experience just, you know, walking down the street of their block and maybe people recognizing them or something. But look, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get people to watch your film, right? People think you'll make a film, you know, billions of people will see it. It doesn't work like that, you know, so for the I don't know how many people will see it, but regardless, it would be very, I think it's unlikely that my parents will become famous off of this. They'll be famous in certain circles and, you know, and there'll be people who are aware that they exist, but I, I, I try to calm them about that, right? Like they're not, you're not gonna become a, you know, a celebrity. Although my, again, my father would absolutely love that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm trying to remember, I think like the, for me, the next salient, scene was the pig save mm. right which is like a such a totally different valence and and oh, actually before that so in 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 the interaction with your parents like for the people who you made the film for or you know the 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 low-hanging fruit like you know the people who are going to go buy the film and tweet about it and us you know the progressive <laughs> vegan plant-based crowd right we're like oh brian makes total sense there and then you juxtapose yourself 
against ethical vegans who who think you're terrible. <laughs> I they're definitely they definitely have concerns about the reduced vegetarian approach. Although you're right, actually, I should take that back. There are there I participated at an animal rights conference where I spoke, and I think that there were the protesters there really did think I was terrible, or at least a danger to mm -hmm. the movement at a minimum. You know, there was one activist who came up to me and said, you don't, she looked right at me. And it really was so mean. It was just sort of, uh, you don't belong here. You shouldn't be here. Um, and that is not my style and not what I want. And that, and I, but I still wanted to give people that were willing to talk with me, um, you know, a fair share. And what I learned as you know, you'll not, you know, from alluding to the pig vigil scene, there's a lot of reasonable arguments for veganism. And there's a lot of reasonable arguments for animal rights and to take a hard line position on that. Um, I kind of knew that intellectually to some extent, um, but in the next scene as where I then go watch pigs on their way to be slaughtered, you know, I think that that was, that was, um, we can talk about it on an emotional level, but intellectually that was a, you know, a moment where, you know, I, I get it. I really get it. I get why people are like, or have these beliefs. I get why they even think I'm dangerous or view me as a, as a, a liability. Um, I get why they're angry. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's even in this moment, right? I had this like primal reaction, like, why did that woman tell me not to be there? And then like, you know, five minutes later now talking, I'm thinking like, oh, I, I kind of understand where it comes from. So it, it's, we're all human and we have these emotions and it's difficult. Um, a part of being compassionate broadly is, is trying to understand the perspective and trying to understand where people are coming from and doing your best to, to react as rationally as you possibly can to that. Um, but I'm happy to talk about the pig vigil if you'd like. Yeah, I, I would like that. I mean, it was so emotional like I'm like I'm like behind the camera I'm thinking like how did you like was that just somebody with an iPhone was that selfie stuff was like how you know how intrusive was your documentary on this like really sacred terrible event yeah um, like let's let's start there and then I, I want to ask yeah. you about the follow-up from it well right the premise is you know an Anita who runs uh, um, the save movement um, which is an, I don't know how she would describe it. So I'll just describe it myself. It's an organization that I think in part hosts these kind of vigils, events, I don't know what to call them, where activists bear witness to pigs being, or another animals, um, you know, on their way to slaughter. And there's a moment in the, in the, you know, in the film where I say to her, basically, I don't get why you're doing this. I mean, this doesn't save the pigs, you know, and she says, you're going to be a different person. I do not want to go to the pig vigil, by the way. Um, genuinely. I mean, who would? Who wants to see pigs be, you know, trucked to slaughter? Um, thank goodness for Journey, who was like, no, you need to do this. <laughs> this is, you know, I don't know where we're gonna, what's going to happen, but we have to go. Um, and it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's very late. Um, and, it, I, you know, again, it's, I'm not, a, I, I really historically didn't think of myself as an activist. Like, None of my friends, most of my close friends are not activists. I'm just a normal guy <laughs> and I'm pretty risk adverse also as a person. So, um, but you know, I went, went, went there this evening and yeah, it's one of the most awful um, things I've ever seen and participated in. Um, it, the sounds, the, the smells, the, the, the collective feeling of sadness, the, uh, I use the word pathetic a lot in the film. There's something very just pathetic about these pigs, you know, putting their nose out into these these holes of the truck and activists spraying water. And, uh, you know, so Nita was right, essentially. I mean, that was a pivotal moment in my own emotional journey where I went from kind of being, a, I don't know, not an academic, but someone who was leaning more into an intellectualism to a person who... Um, I'm, I'm always been a sensitive guy, but I, I feel a sense of sensitivity now around the issues with, with factory farming. Um, and it also made me angry, right? Because I think, you know, I, dis, despite what I knew, being there um, is so much more real than like watching a factory farming video or something. 
Um, and yeah, I get why people are vegan. I get why animal rights activists are very upset at factory farming at slaughter at large. And um, it was an emotional moment that I will always remember. And with that said, um, you know, like I still, if you, if you held up a piece of bacon on the screen, I would still salivate at it. And how effed up is that? Like, that's pretty remarkable, right? And I think it took me like five days to get back to that place. Like I, again, I can get emotional and I can think about it, but it's just to say the power of meat, wherever it comes from, evolution, our biology, or the, because we have so many processed foods, I don't know, but it has a hold over people, including me. And I feel a part of my brain be grossed out by it and another part of my brain, you know, start to salivate at it. So that leads into the next, next part of the film, which we could talk about. Um, but yeah, it was a, a very, very emotional moment. And I learned a lot and I'm very grateful for Anita and guard, you know, she was like, damn, she was right. I definitely became something different. I, you know, maybe even an activist after that. Yeah, well, I mean, but, you know, watching it and watching you, like, there were, like, I was thinking about, honestly, the Holocaust, and how it was so easy for people to just ignore it. And then sort of modern day analogs to that, you know, the, like, I don't spend my time trying to save people. And yet I will judge my grandparents' generation for like, what did you do? And, and, and at the same time, you know, I, I like you, from knowing you for years and reading a lot of your writing, you're very much in sort of the, you know, effective, active, effective philanthropy, like let's do cost benefit analysis and let's be very rational about this. And there you were sort of shaking with, with anger and grief and I was really wondering, like, how will this change, Brian? Because you didn't, you know, immediately become an animal rights, like, nothing, you know, all or nothing person. You then later went and visited a, a, a farm there where they slaughter animals. Like, so what was, what were the takeaways that were long lasting, that lasted longer than your five day aversion mm -hmm. debate? You know, again, I think I think the main thing that lasted was I understand vegans and animal rights activists a lot more. I mean, I understand, like, here's an example. You know, I, I know some people who they don't want to be around me, period. And to me, that it's just a strange, strange thing to me. You know, I, I live in the world. It meets everywhere. Um, and I almost had a slight judgment about it. Like, oh, you need to toughen up, you know, mm -hmm. um, be a little less emotional about this. And, you know, f f for people's own mental health, that might be useful because unfortunately meat is everywhere. But I get it, because I, I, I see, every time I see bacon, you know, despite what I just said about still salivating at it, I, I'm instantly transported back to that moment where I'm, I'm watching these pigs. I can, I can see in my mind, you know, those pigs on the truck. I can see their eyes. I can see, you know, that one pig looking back at me. And, what gets me emotional, um, even talking about this, is just the, the and the, you know the the feeling of helplessness on both parts. Obviously, worse for the pig than for me, but you know I can't do anything legally, um, and obviously the the pig um, is not capable of es escaping the system. So there's just is this a painful feeling of hopelessness that you know I think of when I think of that that moment. So I have a tremendous uh, amount of now of compassion for, um, for vegans, for animal rights um, activists. And that has, that has stayed with me, um, you know, more than maybe more than anything else. Um, it still begs the question what to do about the problem, which is, I think, an intellectual question. Um, so I can kind of shut my, <laughs> shut, shut the emotional part of my brain off and try to be as, you know, reasonable as possible, I guess. Um, but yeah, I get why people are pissed. I get why they're sad. Um, I get it. And I, and I, if you go to, a, you know, if some, if anyone were to go to a pig vigil like that, you would, you'd really quickly get it too. I mean, whatever divisions I felt, you know, from vegans and animal rights activists with myself, those evaporated the moment I stood out there. I might not have had a V on my shirt. I might not have held up the letter V with my fingers. 
you know, um, but uh, I feel, you know, a sense of solidarity um, with that community that um, I hadn't before. So, and of course it's worth noting vegans and animal rights activists are not a monolith, right? Many of them do prefer more compromising, more pragmatic, pragmatic um, avenues of, uh, of activism. But for those who take a hardline position, who think that reduced vegetarian, um, you know, sucks, is dangerous and so on, I understand their, their concerns. Um, and I understand what's at stake really more than anything else. Mm. I mean, part of me is thinking that maybe the extended compassion is really the long-term gift of the film that we, you know, like, yeah, like this is all intellectually impossible to solve. Like we're not, so like as, as much as I admire your intellect and the community in which you thrive around reasonable and actionable and strategic, at some level, we're all like, this is bigger than anything we've got. And like, like one of the things that really struck me about the film is it is so not of this moment in terms of, can we all get along? Can, or, or at least, can we listen to each other with respect and impute positive intent? Like this is like social media is exactly the opposite where you've, we get our tribes, we vilify everyone else, the extremes get amplified and you're coming out driving right down the middle saying everyone in this story is partially right and is worth listening to, worth respecting, worth honoring in some way. And I'm sure if you had gone in and interviewed the people who own yeah, I think I think you did talk about like if we stopped factory farming, like there would be food shortages, hunger, suffering. Like there's like everybody has something good in them, and like for me that that's like I don't know how the hell that's going to help anybody, but <laughs> in my gut it's like that's got to be a huge part of the answer just to be able to have conversations across these barriers. Yeah, I agree that that's really a key takeaway from the film. And, you know, I think this is where I get most passionate, maybe even a little bit hardlined, is we, we disagree about so much as a society. And I think because of that, or at least in part because of that, we miss an opportunity to, uh, to focus on what we do agree on. So I actually find that part of it the most interesting. It's like the vast majority of people, including those in the film, think that we need to reduce societal consumption of animal products. They think that we need to end, end factory farming. 99% of meat comes from factory farms. Obviously factory farms are worse in every possible way uh, than um, you know, a, a practice of raising animals that does not involve degradation of the land and, and cruelty and, and so on. So to me, the takeaway is let's put away our differences um, and actually pragmatically get to work on, on, you know, on, en on ending this, this major problem, which is factory farming. And then to take it to one, one step further. Yeah, you're right. Like even when you, at least uh, even when you disagree with someone, they often share the same values as you. Like, you know, maybe this is this is too um, outside the field here, but I, you know, I just I just wrote an article about about conservatives and, and liberals and their relationship to meat eating, and I have a couple of friends who are conservative, and you know, someone said there's no such thing as well reasoned conservatism, um, and I can tell you like these people are smart, my my friends who are conservative, like, and they in, in the majority of cases have the exact same goals as me. Like they want the world to be a better place. They want to get rid of poverty. They want people to be happy. They just strategically disagree about how to do that. And I disagree with them about what they, how they want to go about doing that. Um, and I'm not saying that we should lump all conservatives being well-reasoned. Many are not, many are nuts. But the, tr the truth is many liberals are also a little insane. It's, it's, it's too many people to say one person is a genius or, or dumb. Um, but we have to find common ground and see the good in people because it's the only way we can have conversations and otherwise we're gonna miss opportunities to work together. So in the context of the film, 
everybody hates factory farming. I think that's more than enough. Most people want us to reduce consumption of animal products, increase consumption of plant-based foods, more than enough. It's fun to have conversations here, you know, at the dinner table in philosophy classrooms about, you know, after factory farming, what else we should do to make the world a better place in the context, context of our food system. But that's really just academic sport. To the pigs, you know, like the ones that I saw that are in those systems, ending factory farming is the answer right now. And it's going to be incredibly difficult to do. Yeah, and, and you know, because I, I love lumping everyone who disagrees with me into the category of psycho evil, <laughs> because it's so easy, right? Because then it, it lets me off the hook, because there's not, what, you know, what am I going to do? There's nothing to do. And of course, what that does is it, it, um, it reifies my powerlessness. Like to be to be able to be willing to go and talk to people, and not browbeat them, criticize them, shame them, but really listen. First of all, it takes a lot of courage to listen to someone who you disagree with so strongly and monitor your own reactions, right? And not get pissed off and not escalate. So, like that's a whole practice. Yeah. But then to be able to to say, well, what do they have to teach me? And, and where, you know, by just showing respect, like I just wrote a, um, co-wrote an op-ed that may be published in CNN this week about how to talk to people who are vaccine hesitant. And everybody I know, including me, it, part of our brains are like, F them. <laughs> they're, they're stupid, they're, they're selfish, right? And from that place, nothing gets done unless I have the military putting shots in arms, right? So like if I have the power to make you, you know, if I had the power to stop factory farming, like we wouldn't need films, we wouldn't need discussion. I would just do it. Right. But given that I don't have the power, I've got to swallow the pill of being willing to communicate with people that I may deeply disagree with. And in, in my experience, like that, that always feels good. <laughs> like, yeah. like I, I don't leave those, I leave conversations where I belittle someone, I feel a little slimy. But when I've been like really listening, oh, okay, so that's how you feel. Like it genuinely feels good. Like I'm doing some good in the world. I think that's right. I think it is really hard. And I know you, know you or I are not perfect about it. I know there are lots of times, I'm sure. I know for me, I get angry. And, and even, in, even in the film with my parents, I mean, you can see I'm getting frustrated. I'm not, you know, thank you for raising me, mom and dad. You did an incredible job. I don't say that over and over again. You know, I have a reaction to my parents saying stuff that I think is absurd. Um, but yeah, I think deep down, by and large, people are good people. They're often disempowered. Um, and it just doesn't, I've never changed my mind with someone shaming me or yelling at me. You know, I, I think shame can be a powerful motivator. I'm sure there are activists who leverage that in the right, right time and moment. But, you know, I like to think that, you know, the, the vegans that were nice to me, like Anita, despite even the fact that Anita disagreed with me and had no problem saying that, she was nice. She treated me with dignity. Um, mm -hmm. as a person who was, you know, actually trying to make the world a better place, but she felt I was strategically wrong. That's fine. Um, and that left me with a really good view of vegans and animal rights activists. And there are many, many others who some feature in the film and others I, that I interviewed who, you know, were very nice and kind. Um, and we were able to see eye to eye on what we agreed with and we were able to disagree. So it's just to say, you don't have to abandon your values or your principles, but I think you know, giving people the benefit of the doubt is, is a, is a, is a really good thing. And, you know, I think I had the strongest reaction of that with Will Harris at White Oak Pasture. The, so like in the, the, the transition point here after pig, the pig vigil is, you know, can we just show people this, right? Can we just show people this pig vigil and will they change their mind? And probably not, you know, it might change some people's minds, but by and large people, they choose food based on price, taste, and convenience. So the, the second part of the film is asking what options are out there besides factory farmed meat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I really struggled with whether to include meat that did not come from a factory farm 
And I remember finally reaching a point where I said, this, this, I can't not do this. This is my, in my heart, this is the right thing to do. And whatever the reaction is, you know, I've been at Reduced Strain Foundation for seven years. So it's been a good run if necessary. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, look, Will Harris is so charismatic. He reminds me of my dad in a lot of ways. He's super charming. He's funny. He doesn't take himself too seriously. And yet he's super tough. I wouldn't want to, you know, cross him. Um, he's treated me with a lot of respect and dignity. And showed me how to raise animals in ways where you're not torturing them. I mean, to, you know, his, to, to say that his farm is like a factory farm is anti-reality. They're nothing alike. Um, the animals are, are treated um, infinitely better. And I'm sure, and his farm is an exception, right? Even among, even among better farms, his is the Disneyland, the Disney world of a farm. So you're looking at the absolute best and I get that. Um, and yeah, slaughter sucks. Um, seeing an animal slaughtered was one of the worst things I've ever seen. The way that animal was slaughtered was way better than how animals are slaughtered in factory farms. And that animal had a good life, um, you know, up until that moment. And it's up for people to decide, you know, whether that's something that they want to um, consume or not, given some of the other disadvantages, like the fact that it's more expensive, uh, but it's better than factory farm meat. And by better, I mean a thousand times better. There's no, there's no one number I could even come up with to describe how much better it is than a factory farm. And I don't mean to be defensive about it. It's just to say that anyone who um, I think is, is not being, they're not being honest if they think that they're the same. They're not. Maybe the slaughter, dying sucks no matter how, how, you're, how you're killed. Um, but until that moment, it's a lot better. So yeah, that's why we decided to uh, include it in the film. And I'm, I am really grateful for Will. And um, I mean, he was, his family was practicing factory farming for generations. So the fact that he abandoned, you know, abandoned that system for a significantly more compassionate one is something that really should be commended. And I consider him to be a, a personal hero of mine, quite frankly. Yeah, the, the, I mean that scene, the whole that that whole part of the film, it felt like, like it, it would have been a dishonest film had you left that out. Yeah, it, it would have been another screed, and like to go from the pig vigil to like a totally different perspective that is equally steeped in ethics. You know whether you agree with the ethics or not. Like this guy is not bullshitting. He's not playing, right? He is, um, he's doing what he thinks is his role in, in making the world a better place. And, you know, like I loved sort of the banter. <laughs> right. I, I was thinking like, I, I would be so, like you had a great little joke in there about, you know, your poop face. <laughs> right, like, right. When he said he doesn't want, you know, he, he wasn't gonna let you film the slaughter out of dignity. And you're like, you, you know, like you wouldn't watch, you wouldn't film me defecating. But yeah, my face. Like it was, right. it was charming, but it was so human. And you left, and the first thing you said is after after the filming is like, I still had issues with it. But you, you know, again, you're putting yourself in this in this place where as the audience's proxy, it was okay for me to not know. Oh, but you know, it's like that line, there's that great line in Fiddler on the Roof where they're arguing and Tevi says, well, oh, you're right and you're right. And someone says, how can they both be right? He says, you know, you're also right. It's a, it's a, it's a the way I think of it is it's a, a major downside. I mean, I, I don't mean to put it as so coldly, but there are all these options at our disposal to, you know, instead of factory farming. And I think the one that is pretty glaring is the fact that you still have to kill an animal and Will himself, you know, says something to the effect of you have to be an unhealthy person to enjoy slaughter. I mean, mm -hmm. he's on it again. He's, he's very proud of what he does and he um, rightly acknowledges that he, even his practice of slaughter is significantly better than factory farming. Um, but yeah, it still sucks. It's still a downside of, of life. Uh, and that's something for people to consider when they're thinking about whether they want to continue to eat meat, even if it doesn't come from a factory farm. Um, but I am happy, as, personally, I'm happy as long as it doesn't come from a factory farm. That's my, that's my, base, that's my baseline, personally. Right. So I was, you know, totally with you through the, the pig save, totally with you through w w Will Harris's farm. 
But then like the anti-capitalist in me started getting all wound up around the new technologies. And, you know, and these are companies with, you know, um, 50, $500 million valuations. And <laughs> like, oh, just, just another bunch of Zuckerberg's, Bezos's, Branson's, like, right. And, and you're talking about stuff that's kind of beautiful, like this technology that can free us Right. from the need for for overlordship over other creatures <laughs> and that's and like it was so interesting like that's where my gander was up oh good i'm ex- i'd love to talk to you about that like like that was my yeah but right so, so why don't you just just describe like what what are some of the technologies that you covered for- yeah you know plant-based meat so essentially companies like beyond Meat, impossible foods they are creating meat with quotation marks on it, for those who can't see me, from plants. They are recreating the taste, the texture, the experience. And that's a beautiful thing because you don't have to kill an animal. It requires significantly fewer re- land resources. It emits fewer um, emissions. And it is marginally healthier, from what I can tell based on the health data, than animal-based meat. Um, specifically those from, from factory farms. Uh, and then, and it's available right now, right? It's, it's not something you need to wait for. It's slightly more expensive, which is a, a, a problem. And it's not as, uh, not as uh, convenient to get, but hopefully that will, that will continue to change. Then there's cell cultured meat. Um, sometimes this is referred to as lab grown meat, which is not a, a fair or accurate term because it's just prototyped in a lab. Um, but essentially you take a, a cell from an animal and you grow that cell in a nutrient dense environment outside of an animal and through fancy science um, at the end, you have meat, meat that is nature identical to an animal. Uh, you're just changing the process and how it's grown, but the end result is essentially the same. That has problems. Um, it's expensive very expensive. Uh, it's not available at all for the most part, except in, in Singapore at the moment. There hasn't been regulatory approval here in the United States. Um, and yes, of course, one of the problems that someone might have issues with, what I would call a downside, if you're an anti-capitalist, if you don't want to support that system, you're relying on this same structure where rich people give money to companies to create products, they own IP, you know, um, if you want to democratize the food system, you know, it, you, you might not be excited about one or two or three companies owning 80% of the plant-based meat market or 90% of the cell culture meat market. And I don't know what's going to be, but I think that's certainly possible. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I have a boring response, but I'd be curious for your feelings on it. It's just that it's still better than factory farming. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's I, you know, and it's like, uh, if, yeah, I mean, if I, if you could tell me how to, how to get away from factory farming and end capitalism, assuming or, or significantly diminish its influence and assuming that was actually better for the world, um, I would be all for it. And I, but um, right now, those are the three options that I see available to us. And I think with my takeaway, even from this conversation is some people's downsides are the volume is turned up, Right. Like for some people, the downside on slaughter is no-go. For some people, the downside on capitalism, that complex, no-go. Um, and to that, I say, well, you know, I-, I wouldn't actively oppose any of those solutions since they're all better than factory farming, but you don't necessarily, you in a broad sense, don't necessarily need to support for yourself um, what you're against. Um, you could you could simply eat broccoli if you so to choose, or you can purchase meat from Will's Farm instead. Mm-hmm. I like there's options for everyone, I suppose. But I'd be curious for your take on that as well. Yeah, well, I want to call myself out because for me, like I'm fine with your incrementalism on several dimensions, and on this one dimension, I'm like, no, <laughs> this is unacceptable. And it doesn't mean that I'm an anti-capitalist activist warrior for justice. I'm just like, no, I, you know, like it, like it's a cop out. Like, I don't have any problem with, with the, you know, the vegans doing the pig save or like really living up to their, um, their values around like no compromise is possible. 
we're just we've got to end this completely. Like maybe, you know, there, maybe there's a role for that. Like maybe you need that group to sort of tenderize the margins and then you need a big group in the middle to be more, let's say pragmatic. I mean, I don't even know if that's the right word or if that's sort of value laden, yeah. um, more conciliatory and conversational. Um, but what I found unacceptable in my own reaction is I'm, I'm using this Maginot line in my mind to essentially opt out of doing anything. Like, like if I were, if I really wanted to do the best for the world, I'd be like, hey, everybody try this Beyond Beef Burger. And in fact, I'm having a party for my ultimate Frisbee team in a couple of weeks. We're gonna have a cookout and I'm gonna just, you know, go to Costco and clear their shelves of whatever they've got, Impossible or, or Beyond. Right. And I'm like, I, you know, oh, and, oh, and I don't like that stuff for health reasons, because saturated fat and coconut oil and all that. And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> But like there's a there's a certain either either go all out and do your own thing or be mature enough to acknowledge that that your you know that Brian Cateman's and and reducitarian's approach is a very powerful generative one and it's probably it's if it's not rubbing you the wrong way in some respect you're probably not paying attention and that's no reason not to embrace it that's certainly my takeaway. And, you know, again, none of these solutions are perfect. And if anybody has a better solution, you know, and that maybe that's kind of the feeling like, okay, like what, what would you do, Howie? You know, like what, what would you suggest that we go out and do, you know, who did you vote for? I mean, did he, did that person win the election that you voted for? Uh, have you, you know, so you can, you do your, you do your best within the confines of your preferences. And then what's left, I would choose the, if you want to take the most cynical view of this, you kind of take the lesser of the evil and you promote that. But, you know, even here's an example, like, okay, so not saying you specifically, but folks who are, you know, against, let's say, capitalism models, or they're against the, the large corporations, there's plenty of small independent plant-based meat makers that are just a family that are, you know, creating these products, go buy their products instead, um, you know, of, uh, you know, of, of like a company like Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods. Um, so, yeah, and I, and I, you know, I get it. I, I think, it's funny, like I've been trying to think of this lately for myself, is, is my view on this, does it come from a place of realism, of, of, of pessimism, of cynicalness? Like, I, my baseline is so low. I see so much pain and suffering around me that, and I think a lot of people feel this and see this. And so there's two options. Do we go all out, whatever that means, and go to get rid of it all, or do we just accept, for, at least for now, that, that a little less suffering is still better? And in my opinion, even if you, as you were kind of were alluding to, even if you want the world to look like the utopia that you, you know, one might describe, you're still going to have to get there in steps. So if you don't want the step to, to be playing into the capitalist society, you're going to have to find another step that you feel comfortable with anyway. So... I think what it comes down to let's not all actively oppose one another. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to really argue with Anita or for Anita to argue with me. Like we both don't like factory farming. So let's just, we'll just, we'll just take our aim. We'll both, you know, do the best we can within the chosen strategy and we'll do our best not to undermine each other to the extent possible. And it won't always be perfect. Sometimes I'm going to say things like, you know, veganism is going to be more difficult than getting people to eat less meat. And maybe you're going to say, you know, uh, I like plant-based meat. I just wish it wasn't part of this, you know, capitalistic society, which is causing so much suffering. Um, so we do the best we can within the confines of, of this difficult reality that we live in. So it's, it's early days for the film. It's only been out for, I think, a couple of weeks now. Right. I'm, cur I'm curious what have been the most um, useful, amazing, fun, interesting, surprising responses whether critiques that you hadn't anticipated or kudos that were coming from places that you hadn't thought, you know, like what's so far, what's been interesting? Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of them and some of them are personal and some of them are about the film. Maybe we'll take a couple. I have to, I, it's so funny. Like I was just, we were talking about this at the start, right? Like we analyzed every second of the film. 
I mean, it's just it's absurd the amount of work that goes into every piece of decision making, what sound by it, what overlay of, of imagery are we going to choose? And we still miss things, which is another humbling feat of, of humans. One thing that didn't even remotely occur to me was this, was this fact that the guacamole wasn't a whole sort of fresh food. Didn't even occur to me, in part because we didn't have, a, in my opinion, we didn't really have a, I mean, I guess we, I guess we, I could have, I guess I could have prepared it on the, you know, on the concrete or something outside my parents' house. My mom really didn't want me to, to you know, make anything as best, as best as, you know, I could um, and as sensitive around the kitchen. So, but it didn't, it didn't occur to me that this was going to be a, you know, a, a major talking point. Um, I'm glad that avocado comes back later at the end of the film and it's, it's proper glorious form. Um, one good counter argument would be like my parents own really only eat processed food. So maybe the processed nature of the guacamole was actually good. I don't know for them. Um, so that was one thing that really, really surprised me. Um, you know, I had a childhood friend, or sorry, a childhood colleague from college. We had a lot of fights in college, arguments, both arrogant jerks, absolute arrogant douchebags, both of us. And he reached out to me and he said, I hadn't spoken to him in like 10 years. And he reached out and said, hey, I saw you have a new film, congrats. And I wrote and I said, uh, you know, I really appreciate that. By the way, sorry, I was a jerk um, in college. And he wrote back, you know, I was going to say the thing, same thing, but I didn't want to open old wounds. And, you know, we're now in our 30s and it's, it's just mind boggling, like the perception you have of another person that's so outdated mm -hmm. and reconnecting. And I like that there was like a personal anecdote of kind of compassion and meeting halfway. And um, so that was another another surprise, just like the personal life, people seeing the film and reacting to it. And that brought me a lot of a lot of joy. Um, there were people who saw old versions of the film that were kind of test screening. And I heard that they love the new decisions that we, that we made, um, which is really gratifying. I also was really scared. Like, I don't, I, I just to drive this home, like I'm a fairly nervous, anxious person. Um, a lot of my friends will lovingly call me neurotic. And I was very nervous about the film releasing it, nervous for people's reactions. I was worried about getting, getting sued. I wanted to make sure I did every due diligence correctly. And Gosh, like the amount of time I wasted being anxious and worrying and everything turned out, not to say every single person will love the film, they'll disagree with components of it, of course, but um, it's just another rem <laughs> reminder to sometimes, you know, just try to be as happy as you can and, and do what you can not, not to worry. So that was another, out of a lot, a lot of imagined fears that did not, did not come to pass, pass. so we wasted a lot of time worrying. Yeah. Although at, at the same time, though, like there's a way in which you're kind of embracing your neuroticism, you know, by using that label as yeah. kind of a superpower. Yeah. Like, like to, you know, like, I mean, I just, I just, I feel like, like cuddling your, your neuroticism and saying <laughs> like, like it has its place. Like you no, were, you were incredibly careful. Um, you know, you see what the health come out and then you see a slew of, slings and arrows, like taking down every point that wasn't a hundred percent or like comparing cigarettes to meat or, you know, like, you know, then you see Seaspiracy come out and like the media saying, wow, they, it's hard to argue with that. Like they really, like there was something about the, this, you know, meet me halfway and that the care and the anticipation of, I don't, I don't want to represent anything incorrect because that's what's going to deflate the whole thing for people. I know it really it's a, it's a it is a double edged sword like many like many strengths and weaknesses it it certainly is. I so there was the the byproduct of being anxious maybe and being or careful if you want to choose a nicer term a, a great film came out. But it definitely had some costs and sometimes my fear was I think a little you know tuned up we keep I refer to that word again on the on the wrong things. Um, mm. but I hear you I appreciate you celebrating who I am to the to the, the best of our abilities. I'm a little, you know, it's funny, like I'm tired. I'm just tired. I'm at a place where I'm ready to relax the next next couple of weeks and months. And I'm, I'm definitely taking a break. Um, you know, burnout's real. Um, and I'm really excited to to let go of the neuroticism a little and and nurture my my more calm side as, as best that I possibly can. Uh-huh. 
Cool. So I just a personal, semi-personal question. So I saw you, I think it was 2019 at Reducitarian. Where was the film at that point? Just uh, try, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to sort of like remember yeah. how you, because you were very sort of engaging, Mr. MC, relaxed. There was a very heavy vegan, like animal, animal welfare vibe at the conference. Mm -hmm. Like where was that? Was like, was that after? the pig save or before that's a really good question um and I'm, I'm worried i won't have my dates correctly so um we're in 2021 2019 i think i think that was i think 2019 was after we had completed the the, the pig vigil scene um it's i think to my memory um i think that a lot of the filming took place over 2018 and 2019 and a lot of the editing as well and then there were a couple of things that took place later um one is that we decided to go visit helen who has a farm that is a also practices regenerative agriculture like will but does not use an, what, animal, what Will calls animal impact or the idea of using animals to cultivate the land. That scene did not make it into the final cut of the film. It is a bonus clip though, for folks that um, watch it on iTunes, there's a bonus scene um, as well as some additional scenes with Will. Um, my dad, if you, you know, if you see the film has another appearance at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. And I kid you not, you know, we were basically done with filming. We had reached a point where we were just editing and my dad truly communicated to me that, and I knew he was starting to lose a little bit of weight, but I didn't fully understand what was going on there. And, you know, he sends, he texts me a photo of him with his shirt off. And you can imagine like I, I, for folks that are looking like, he's like really happy and proud in his like silly, beautiful way. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, like, you know, what, what, did, what, what's going on? And, you know, he started working out as part of his, his recommendation from um, from the fitness trainer, you know, wanted him to eat more healthy, to eat more more plant based foods, to lay off the 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 fast food, usually you know meat very meat laden. So it wasn't me who convinced him, um, but I planted a seed. I hope. Right, and, and, you I, did, and you didn't stop him from being convinced. Right. Yes. Right? Like you, yeah. you didn't make him like double down to the point where like, well, I can never, you know, I'm not going to give that little pitcher the satisfaction. <laughs> I, yes, I think that's, I think that's accurate. And he was very, very willing to very quickly embrace the genius of the revelation on his own that eating healthy is very important. Uh, and so we flew him to LA um, at the last minute, December of, I think it was December of 2019. Hmm. It was the last scene we filmed, came over and, you know, had, had avocado toast with me. Uh, um, and so, then more editing took place over 2020. And then we kind of finally got our distribution plan together and rolled it out in 2021. But there is a, a genuine evolution in my thinking and, and my, also my comfort of just kind of, you know, standing up for what I think is true and just kind of, kind of going for it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the journey of the five-year making of Meet Me Halfway. Beautiful. And what I kind of hope the, the legacy will be is to give voice to what I suspect is the silent majority, right? Whom we don't hear from because they're not, you know, they're not in these, you know, tribes screaming right. their lungs out like, yeah, we should have less meat. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's, it's not, it's really not that controversial. I mean, as, as, as much as I, we try to create some level of disagreement and controversy within the context of the film, the takeaway is is a no brainer, and it's very much agreed upon by basically everyone that's featured. Factory farming sucks. In order to end factory farming, we really all need to eat fewer animal products. Here are some solutions on the table at the moment to help make that happen. Um, that's really hard to do, and that's really inspiring to me. And I believe that we should try to come together as much as humanly possible to in embrace this. Like, how often do we agree on anything to your point earlier? You know, this is something we agree on. Don't be distracted by some of these larger, you know, debates. They just don't matter in terms of this movement. These are the, the number one issue, ending factory farming, reducing consumption of animal products. So let's 
let's get out there and, and, and meet each other halfway and make it happen. Yes, you, you, you nailed the tagline. Yeah. <laughs> so where can people watch the movie? Where can they find you online to, to follow and continue and move it forward? Yeah, all the information about the film is on meetmehalfway.org. You can and watch that, it. That meet is punnily spelled M-E-A-T. That's right. I didn't, I didn't point this out earlier, but earlier you used the word tenderize. I don't even know if you caught it. That was amazing. Uh, you used it in a perfectly natural fashion. It was a very, oh. meaty, very meaty pun. Yeah, you'll, you'll listen to this later and you'll, you'll hear it again. <laughs> um, meetmehalfway.org, M-E-A-T. Um, Amazon, iTunes, Google Play. For folks who are anywhere in the world, um, Vimeo On Demand. And you can learn more about the Reducitarian movement and other ways to engage at reducitarian.org. And I'm really grateful for anyone who is doing what they can personally to cut back on animal products, to encourage others to do the same. And I believe that if we're going to make it happen, if we're gonna put factory farming you know, in the dustbin of history where it belongs, that it is gonna require lots of people doing at least small acts of, of kindness by adding more plates to their menu. I'm oh, sorry, to their, their, their more plants to their plate. So fingers, fingers crossed for that. And I really appreciate how we uh, having the opportunity to chat with you again. Right on. This is such a pleasure. Um, it's, it's so great to just have the privilege to talk to creative artists about their work and what's behind it. And, and to see, you know, to, to see you, I don't know if you saw yourself as a creative artist before this process, no. but like what, you know, to, to see what's within you and to see a giant community, like watching the scrolling at the end, all these names of people, um, it's, you know, it is an epic feat of, of, of humanity coming together to put this together. And I just want to thank you for, for guiding it for you, you and Journey and for, for letting those spirits shine. I really appreciate that. And, and you know, any, anybody can go out, you know, if they have the, the will and the privilege and the circumstances and so on, you know, it's, it's, it's doable. Um, and I'm really honored that I got to share it with the world and, and with you today. Right on. Well, enjoy your however many weeks off you're going to give yourself. You, yes. You deserve a lot. And uh, I look forward to following your writing and uh, seeing what you come up with next. Likewise. Thanks so much again for having me. A pleasure. Take care. Bye.